Hello, and welcome to Traditional Chinese Medicine. Today we're going to talk about Chinese nutrition, grains and starches, part two. My name is Christina Kapothanasis. I am a licensed acupuncturist here in the state of Hawaii, and I am board certified under the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. I am also the executive director of the Hawaii Oriental Medicine and Acupuncture Association. Thank you, thank you for joining me for part two. I ran out of time to share with you all my exciting information on Chinese nutrition, our uh, new series to go into detail about the different types of foods and their qualities, their taste, thermal quality, what organs they're associated with, and the functions of each one. Just as herbs have these qualities, so do foods. And I was saying last time, the food is our best medicine. Yes, it is. I hope that everybody can eat a very clean diet to have their system run as efficiently as possible so that they can feel their best, sleep well, sleep deeply, wake refreshed, and have lots of energy and be happy through the day. Then we can all be completely productive and happy. Um, I Last time, and you can look on olelo.org's website or you can look on our website um, for part one um, or you can call us to ask some questions that you have. We went over the different colors of rice and buckwheat, millet, amaranth, and my not so liked wheat, corn, and quinoa. And we started the higher glycemic starches of mountain yam, sweet potato, and taro. And then we are next ready for a category where several are lumped together. Um, but nevertheless, it is pumpkin, or the small Japanese kabocha pumpkins, butternut squash, and acorn squash. I think the one that people may have most trouble associating with is the kabocha pumpkin, which may not be in every city in the US, but it is readily accessible here in Hawaii, and I brought a picture for you today. If we could show everyone that picture. They are little tiny green um, pumpkins. They will never turn orange like a regular pumpkin on the outside. And as you can see, the front part of the picture where they're cut open in half, the filling is still mostly seeds, but the meat is definitely delicate and sweet. It's delicious. So this will be um, one category that we're going to talk about. It is a sweet flavor and it is a neutral thermal quality. And for those of you who did not join our last session, the thermal quality is talking about the effect that it has on the body. So is it very warm, as a chili pepper is very hot? Is it neutral, like a pumpkin? Or is it very cold, where maybe you can associate that mint is very cold or banana is very cold? not the temperature of us touching it, but the thermal quality of what it does to the body. It heats you up or it cools you down. Uh, the organs that this vegetable is associated with are the lungs, the spleen, and the stomach. It is wonderful for detoxifying and it is helpful to act as a mild diuretic to reduce swelling in the body. Pumpkin is excellent for male prostate. <laughs> it's good for any kind of lung conditions where there's infection or inflammation in the lungs and or people who are suffering from asthma just to take down a little bit of that swelling and to detoxify. Detoxify would be along those lines for Western medicine. And it's also good to eat if you've had any kind of poisoning whether that be from a bee sting outside or whether that be from taking something internally like seafood that you have some food poisoning from. The only thing we have to pay attention to when we talk about the kabocha is that people that have severe cheese stagnation and a lot of dampness built up in their digestive system, we can't eat too much. And again, I will emphasize 
any kind of bread on your sandwich or toast in the morning or wheat noodles that you're going to eat are going to be way more damaging than the benign little pumpkin. So when we talk about to be careful if you have dampness in your stomach for regular healthy people, this is not a problem. The wheat products will be much worse. Um, but for example, if a pregnant lady is having lots of nausea and vomiting, that is a sign of dampness in her stomach and we probably aren't going to feed her kabocha or butternut squash, okay? So those are the more high glycemic index root vegetables or starchy vegetables and those will make you feel a little bit more satiated. Then we're going to move on to the category of vegetables that is sort of on the fence. They're not quite a starchy vegetable. For example, a carrot. If we ate a whole bowl of carrots, we're not going to feel nearly as full as if we ate a whole bowl of rice or a whole, boy, a whole bowl of poi, the mashed taro um, potato-like root vegetable. Um, but they're not quite non-starchy vegetable, which is, for example, a cucumber or a celery and that very low carb alkalizing food. So we will move on with carrot. Everybody knows what carrot looks like. It's a long orange skinny vegetable that grows in the ground and it's going to have a sweet flavor and it's coming back to this term umami, which is a Japanese term that's trying to Describe the fifth spice, which I introduced last time. So we have sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and then we have shin in Chinese. They sometimes translate that as pungent, or they are now using the term even in the English writing, umami, which I explained is something like if you put mint gum in your mouth and you feel that, oh, fresh, Feeling shin has this kind of a quality to it, dispersing quality. So the carrot has some of that. It is neutral in its thermal nature, so it's not going to make the body hot or cold. And it will go into the organs of the spleen, the lungs, and the liver. So it's going to help to build up the spleen, and it's going to help to calm down the middle. It's also going to help to moisturize the liver and brighten the eyes. So carrots for the eyes. Everybody knows the vitamin A and the beta carotene for eyes. It's good for dissolving or draining dampness and helping to quell a cough. And then it's really good for detoxification and clearing of heat. So the only thing that you would have to be careful for of eating carrots and too many orange vegetables for that matter, sometimes vegetarians that eat lots of vegetables, their skin will turn slightly orange because the beta carotene is a fat soluble vitamin. So it doesn't like a water soluble vitamin just go out with the urine and the skin will um, sometimes turn a little orange if you eat too many carrots. Don't worry, that will go away after you stop eating so many carrots. And if that's the only thing you have to worry about, then you can eat carrots. Um, daikon is another root vegetable. And I brought a picture because here in Hawaii, people know daikon, which is this large, long root vegetable. But maybe in the mainland, daikon isn't as readily accessible in some parts of the country. So it's a white root vegetable, and it's much wider around than a carrot, can you see? <laughs> and they can come short like this, or they can come really long. And you can actually eat the leaves that are on top of them. They were cut off in that picture, but you can eat those just like you eat spinach. Um, the the flavors for the daikon are this umami, this sort of pungent aro aromatic flavor, sweet, and they are slightly cool, though if you cook them, they become neutral in their thermal quality. And if you've ever eaten raw daikon versus cooked daikon, it is a world of a difference. Raw daikon is like spicy wasabi, in my opinion. It is, has, a, has a bite to it. Whereas the cooked one you put in soups, it's 
very sweet. It's almost a completely different food. It will go into the spleen, stomach, and large intestine and lungs. So this vegetable is excellent for making the chi go down and to really help digest the food, just as you can imagine the bite to that raw daikon will be helpful for digestion. It also helps to take care of phlegm, to help dissolve the phlegm, and it helps to make people urinate a little more. It's a mild diuretic. It also has the function of helping to stop bleeding. So when we want the chi to go down, that would mean down as in digestion down, helping people to have proper elimination, and down chi for coughing. So coughing would be the chi coming up. And we want to quell the cough by making the chi go down and to transform the dampness or the phlegm associated with cough. The only thing we would have to be careful for is the people who have colder syndromes, which is very rare here in Hawaii, but more so in China and on mainland US. Then we wouldn't want to feed this to people who have chronic loose stools because they might have too much cold in their spleen and we probably want to cook it to make it more easily digestible for them and a little bit milder in its function. Just don't give a bunch of raw stuff to people with weak digestion. I try to pull in some of the herbs that we use in the clinic that match the foods because I thought it would be interesting. And so the live fuzi, this bottle here, but it's a little bit glossy so I put in this bowl so you can see. The lai fuzi are these little seeds, and these are the seeds to the daikon. So we use just a pinch of this in formulas, uh, usually three to six grams to be exact. I don't do pinches, I'm sorry, I do <laughs> scale. But we use the lai fuzi seeds to help have a stronger um, quality, similar to the daikon root itself. It is, um, it has that pungent or that umami flavor to it. It's neutral in its thermal quality and it's slightly sweet. It enters the same organs of it's helping the lungs and it's helping the digestive system. So it's going to take down the chi, especially with the coughs and the constipation, but is much stronger <laughs> than eating the daikon. And so that's why we use such a small amount of this. Other herbs, we may use up to 30 grams, but this one, three to six grams, it can be very cleansing. Uh, so I, that's just a neat side note that the food and the herbs, again, the line is very blurry between them. We use them interchangeably sometimes. Uh, the next starchy vegetable will be the lotus root. So lotus root, I'm sorry I don't have a picture for you today, but they come in links and they have, they're connected by a darker portion. You can break them apart and when you cut them open, the cross section has a lot of little holes in it like a wheel. You may see this, um, some nice restaurants slice it and put it on top of your salad or in the Japanese dish, the nishime, then you can see chunks of it. I hope you know what I'm talking about, but anyway, you can look up lotus root. This vegetable is really actually very nice on paper, um, but it doesn't have as sweet of a flavor as it says on paper. So it's sweet and it's a cold herb, um, a cold herb slash food. We do use this directly in our pharmacy, just like we use the mountain yam, also called shanyao, also called yamaimo which we discussed in our last episode. We use that directly in our clinic as well, dried. We use the lotus root too. So this cold root is going into the heart, the liver, the spleen, and the stomach. In the clinic, I use it more for the cold property of cooling the blood because it is going to um, cool the blood, which will in turn help me to use it to stop bleeding. So especially for my female patients who have heavy bleeding with their periods, I will put this, and sometimes I will put it in the charcoal format, which is basically burnt lotus roots. And they're small little black things people 
often wonder what did you put in my formula last time. Uh, I can also put it in the raw form if that's too strong. But this idea of clearing heat and helping the body to create fluids, cooling the blood, stopping the blood, and it also has an added benefit very mildly. It helps to transform stagnation, but it is very mild. So women that have periods that have clots in their period, which many people don't know that that's not normal. No, we shouldn't. We should have bright red, fire engine red blood with no clots, no cramping, no breast tenderness, no loose stools or other headaches and PMS signs. So this idea of stagnation, the pain, the cramping, and the clots are stagnation. And it will help to not only stop the bleeding, but to help um, to control the bleeding, to make it less, not stop it completely. But it will also help to dissolve the clots. Uh, the only thing that you'd have to pay attention to is the person with the very weak digestive system do not give them tons of raw lotus root, which I'm sure is not a big problem in the US. Um, another root vegetable that goes with one of the herbs is the burdock. So burdock is the, I really thought I had a picture, I'm so sorry, I don't, but its diameter is very small and it's, it can come this long. It's burdock root, it's also called gobo. And um, it has the root that we can use in cooking, but it also has the seeds, which I don't know if you can see here. The seeds are these little black long seeds. And um, these are the seeds of the gobo or the burdock root. And we use, use these directly in the clinic. So for the burdock root, it is slightly bitter and it has that umami flavor, the pungent aroma, and it's cool. The seed is a little bit cooler, so it falls into the cold category. Just like for the um, laifuzi, the seed of the daikon, then it's a little bit stronger than the root itself, so these are a little bit colder. But the root itself has similar qualities. It is going to be clearing the heat, detoxifying the body, and it helps to get rid of wind, which usually goes along with colds, so the common cold, to help with the um, sore throat and to help get excess dampness out of the body in, in the way of a mild diuretic. The thing that I use the seed for mostly is for colds, people who have a hot cold with a sore throat and a headache or a fever. Um, but I also use it a lot for skin conditions, uh, psoriasis, eczema, hives, etc. Because that is also, when they talk about wind in the body, wind is often um, seen in the skin conditions. And it is an excellent herb for helping with that and getting the skin to heal. So this is just another neat side note how it's directly related to one of our foods, just a little bit stronger than the burdock root itself. Um, we have two more root vegetables to go. So we have the beet, and beets, the little red root vegetables with a long tail on them, the greens that grow above the ground. They're delicious to eat the greens of those two, so please don't waste or throw those away. Uh, this has a sweet flavor, definitely. Everybody knows that beets are sweet, especially if you juice them, juicing beets and carrots. I had that when I was younger, I had no idea. Be careful, juicing beets and carrots are pure sugar. So try to use as little as possible that you're juicing just to sweeten it up and try to use more of the green vegetables instead. It has a little bit of bit, um, excuse me, it has, uh, the, new, the, thermal, the thermal property can be neutral or slightly cooling. It is good for strengthening the digestion and helping to digest food. It's good for stopping cough and transforming the phlegm because it also has the slightly diuretic quality to it. So taking out that 
excess water in the body to dry up the phlegm. And then it's good for detoxifying, especially cleaning the blood, the liver blood. So everybody thinks of beets as iron and blood building. You can also add one more blood quality to that. It helps clean the blood. So beets are excellent root vegetable. And last but not least is the most exciting. It's a, another one that's herb slash food. So this one, I don't know. If you looked at this, can you guess what it is? It's called feng feng. Can you see this one? It's little dried um, pieces of parsnip. So you probably can't tell from this, uh, but feng feng is just dried parsnip. And I think that those are the most exciting foods that are herbs. So it is the um, umami flavor, the dispersing flavor, and it's sweet. And for everybody that doesn't know what a parsnip looks like, it's just a white carrot. They're exactly like carrot looking. They're a little bit more fibrous, but it's white. And they are slightly warm. They go into the bladder and the lungs. They also affect the spleen and the liver. So fang feng or parsnip is an herb that we use quite frequently. We use it again like we do with the neo bangzi, the little seeds of the gobo or the burdock root. Uh, use those in conjunction with other herbs to help treat skin conditions like the psoriasis, eczema, hives, etc. Because it helps to get out the wind, it helps to stop the itchiness, and it is wonderful for getting um, dampness out of the body. So not only are skin conditions wrapped up with wind and heat and dampness, joint pain is also usually wind and damp and heat or cold. So we can use it for skin and we can also use it for people with joint pains. And then just like the Nyobangza, we can use it since it clears the wind from the exterior, which I mentioned is um, hand in hand with the common cold, then we can use this to help people with common cold. They also have Yuping Feng San, which is a formula that people take who are deficient and they get colds easily. So this is an herb that helps strengthen the exterior so you're not so weak and delicate exposed to those gusts of wind or cold AC. And then maybe you can prevent getting sick as often. Though I would say don't take your ping pong song, just eat more vegetables. <laughs> We want to also use this for people with headaches or different pains in the body. And then, like I said, for the itchiness. So we don't have a whole lot of time left to help you know how to cook these. But I will briefly go over some of the things that would stick out in my mind that I would want to mention to you first. So for the black rice, if we're going to cook black rice, make sure that you use the water ratio as you would with brown rice. So a little bit over, maybe two and a quarter cups of water for one cup of grain, because it is a little bit more dense than white rice and needs longer cooking time and more water. The buckwheat, if you toast it, it will taste much better, but it's going to come out as an oatmeal-like consistency. So what I prefer to do with the buckwheat is it's so soft that I can just use my Nutribullet kind of blender uh, to grind it into flour. And then it's so fluffy and nice that I can make um, waffles or pancakes out of the buckwheat. So I prefer it like that. And you might try because different flours turn into pudding when you try to bake with them. Gluten-free cooking is definitely an art. Millet, um, there are two fabulous ways to do millet. You can do millet in a porridge or kanji. So instead of adding the regular three cups of water for one cup of grain, add five or six cups of water for one cup of grain. Maybe cut that recipe in half. And then you'll have a lovely porridge that you can add vegetables and more salty, flavorful foods in and it would be a nice warm winter soup kind of thing for breakfast. 
Amaranth is also, um, I make it two ways. So the way that I like it most, I guess, is if you toast it for a few minutes on low in an open skillet, in a dry skillet, until it starts to pop like popcorn, then you can really enjoy the nutty aroma of amaranth. It's delicious. And then I usually stir it into a different grain because whereas rice, one cup will puff into three cups after it's cooked, amaranth only expands a slight bit. So whatever you put in the pan, you're probably gonna have about that much at the end. So I try to put it into, for example, rice or something else, mix it in, and um, that'll make it a little bit more palatable because it's very dense and chewy. The other way that I like it is if you want a warm comfort food, is you put it in a saucepan with a lid on it, so three cups of water to one cup of grain, and then you can put different kinds of fruit in it, like blueberries, or cherries, and nuts like pecans or almonds, and you make it like oatmeal, and it is mm, like dessert. It's very nourishing breakfast and will stick to your ribs. Don't be scared of the root um, vegetables like mountain yam, sweet potato, taro, and pumpkin, or the like, kabocha, butternut squash. You don't have to heat the whole oven and roast the house here in hot Hawaii. You can just put it in the steamer, cut it into cubes, and it's done in 10 to 15 minutes. It doesn't have that nice roasted flavor, which is lovely, but um, you wouldn't have to be scared to cook it. And then you can mix all kinds of different things together in the blender and make mashed potato so that we can avoid the white potato. You can even add um, the carrot or the parsnip to that mix and any mixture of those. On the poi, they just mash it by adding water, or you can add a little uh, wheat-free soy sauce to those things, or brags. It doesn't have to be fancy. They have tons of sweetness all by themselves. And um, for the lower glycemic index starchy vegetables, carrot, daikon, lotus, gobo, gobo beet, and parsnip, um, what we usually do with, for example, the daikon, we'll put that in a soup or a stew, by all means. It's so much sweeter and easily to, easier to eat. But the other vegetables like carrot and gobo, um, sometimes those are put with mushrooms and chicken into what they call nishime, which is a different kind of a stew recipe. Um, I know I could share so many more recipes with you, but we're out of time for today. So I'll try to do that in a future series. But until next time, thank you for joining us and mahalo.